I want to look at a, a different aspect of um, a, a question that plagued the Republic from its founding in 1787 until the Civil War. And that was the argument about um, states' rights versus uh, nation, uh, nationalist rights. Um, states' rights are otherwise known as decentralism versus a national government's rights, which we would call, we would call centralism. And we know that uh, the Constitution was a compact, and this is from the states' rights approach and how the states, states look at it. The Constitution is a compact created by the states. So therefore, that creates some implications for the federal government and the states. Now, from the state's perspective, the Constitution carefully limits national authority to delegated powers. Unfortunately, for the states, it doesn't say what those powers are. It's basically, in Amendment 10, anything not given to the federal government is reserved for the states. And so the Tenth Amendment, from the state's perspective, gives broad powers to the states. So, from their perspective, when in doubt as to which holds a power, the national government or the state governments, matters should be, re be resolved in favor of the states. Now this implies a strict, what we call a strict constructionist approach to the Constitution. And what that means is that the Constitution says what it says. And we're not interpreting it, it's word for word what it says. And so it's what it says. <coughs> now for some for many people, and for, for, for me for many years, that seemed as if it was too restrictive. And yet, as I've grown older, um, I don't look at it quite the same way. Maybe I've turned around because has the national government gotten too big? Were perhaps the states more right than I originally thought? So, from the state's perspective, the national government has gotten too big, it's gotten too impersonal. People are now just numbers. Um, the American, the, the term, the American people kind of rings hollow. And the argue, can, argument can be made that state governments are closer to the people. Though technology has kind of ground both of those arguments down. And when we look at the followers of states' rights, we see the original nullificationist, uh, John C. Calhoun from the South. And he was the most famous and ardent states' rights representative in the, in the uh, 19th century. But in the 20th century, states' rights, or the argument the government had gotten too big, was coming from uh, conservatives like Barry Goldwater, who was the uh, one of the founders of the modern conservative movement, was the GOP presidential candidate in 1964, and a long-serving um, senator from Arizona. Um, he was accompanied by one of his, in a lot of ways, one of his acolytes, Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California and then president from 1980 to 1988. Also, uh, Newt Gingrich um, would be a, uh, a states' rights of, um, follower, as would be Bush 43 and Ron Paul, and certainly his son, Rand Paul. And I, I left um, three groups out. One would be Southern conservatives, and we'll kind of mix that up with Christian fundamentalists um, because they're different than Western conservatives. Southern conservatives, and of course Christian fundamentalists, elevate social issues in a way that Western conservatives usually don't. Western conservatives lean more libertarian. In any case, all three groups distrust the national government and are much more in favor of states' rights. Now, the nationalist approach says that, well, yeah, the Constitution was created by the people. In the preamble, it says, we the people. And as written, the elastic commerce and taxing and spending clauses give great power to the national government. We're going to cover that a little bit later in this lecture. So when in doubt, power goes to the states only if it has been surrendered by the national government. And when in doubt, matters should be resolved in favor of the national government. And this implies a loose constructionist approach to the Constitution. 
Now, we know that the size of the bureaucracy has remained relatively the same size for the last 40 years, but that's because the federal government has pushed the states and local entities to administer many of the federal programs like welfare. So that meant that there, that has meant that there's an explosion in the size of bureaucracies at the state, <coughs> excuse me, and local levels. But one huge argument in favor of the nationalist approach is this. We know that while state governments may be closer to the people, some of those states have violated people's basic rights, sometimes for decades, like the South during the first uh, 70 years after the Civil War, or longer, actually, after the first 90 years after the Civil War, with Jim Crow and separate but equal. And so the national government has been the key protector of civil rights in so many cases, and that is a very difficult one to argue against. So the followers of a strong nationalist approach have been Alexander Hamilton, the last Federalist John Marshall, who was the first great Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Daniel Webster, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, JFK, LBJ, and then most more recently Clinton, Kerry, and Obama. So let's look at a couple different things. I want to look at, again at the, um, we, we took a good look, a, a good la whack at the, uh, at the elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause when we discussed Marbury v. Madison and then McCulloch v. Maryland. Marbury v. Madison, of course, is judicial review, McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden uh, deal with the national supremacy clause, the elastic clause, and the commerce clause. So I just want to reiterate those again. Um, the creation of a strong national government um, is aided and abetted by what's written in the Constitution. Now, the Constitution grants the national government certain delegated powers, chief of which are the war power, the power to regulate interstate commerce and foreign commerce, and the power to tax and spend, something we didn't cover all that well yet, but we are today. So the delegated powers, which are also, remember, called expressed or enumerated powers, are those that are specifically granted to the federal government by the Constitution. So the War Power Act is this. Uh, the national government is responsible for protecting the nation from external attacks and for declaring war when necessary. Today, defense includes not only maintaining a standing army, navy, and air force, but also the ability to mobilize industry and scientific knowledge to back the efforts of the military. Hence, there are government organizations which, which develop new weapons, not, not, to, not just private sector uh, companies like Lockheed or Northrop, but certainly government organizations like DARPA. The acronym is D-A-R-P-A, -A, and I can't remember what, exactly what DARPA stands for but it's a, a place for cutting-edge technology, especially in a, you know, a military aspect, uh, is, uh, is tested. Now, also remember that the federal government has the responsibility to regulate commerce between the U.S. and foreign nations, as well as trade between the states, which is what we call interstate commerce. The Commerce Clause, which is Article One, Section 8, Clause 3, gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. So therefore, that is a, a addressed in Givens v. Ogden. So the government regulates a wide range of human activity, including agriculture and transportation and finance and product safety and labor relations in the workplace. But few aspects of today's economy affect only commerce in one state. So most activities are subject to the national government's constitutional authority, which was granted in Givens v. Ogden. Now, the power to tax and spend, which will be the last thing that we look at here. Um, even when Congress lacks the constitutional power to legislate, for example, education and agriculture, its power to appropriate money provides Congress with a great deal of control. When Congress finances an undertaking, it determines how the money will be spent. Congress may threaten to withhold funds if a project does not meet federal guidelines. 
In recent years, Congress has refused to finance any program in which benefits are, not, are denied because of race, color, or national origin, and more recently, gender and physical handicap. So, um, so those three are, are very big uh, clauses, and I just wanted to cover them again in addition to looking at federalism from this aspect. Now, in 11, we will be looking at, um, at the um, historical aspect of federalism through its, its um, growth and evolution from one in which it was very separate from what the states did to now, the, and we call that dual federalism, to now what we call marble cake federalism. Even though that, that and that also has been modified since the 1980s, so this is the end of lecture 10, and coming up next will be lecture 11.